Hi, my name is Carola. I, I come from Hamburg in Germany, and I'm working for a company that is called WPS. Yeah, you can see down there, Workplace Solutions, and we are now about 100 software developers in our company. Um, many females, actually. Mm. Yeah, okay. This is the way it is. Um, and um, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, software development for, for companies in Hamburg, and we were so lucky to uh, to come across the book of, of Eric in 2004. We read it and we thought, oh wow, this is cool. So since then we are actually building our software that way, and I can tell you it really helps a lot <laughs> and makes software better. And well, since some years we ended up doing DDD consulting because people are asking us how do you do it and we, we explain it. And um, this is funny because I did a lot of architecture consulting even before and my passion was always to help people to clean up their messy software systems that they had, you know, and to do something about this, what you see up there. I'm a big fan of these um, comics, um, actually done by a German uh, computer scientist, but anyway, he does it in English, you, you, so you can all understand it. They both look at some software and one of them says, oh my God, look at this. And the other says, oh, this is really ugly. And then they do walk away and the other says, oh, well, I'll put a new entry in the Excel sheet. And the other says, great, thank you. And the actual, actual Excel sheet is called technical depth. You know? I don't know if, whether you work like this, but I have a lot of clients that work like this. And um, actually, they need help. So they need um, someone to come around. And this is what I'm doing since 20 years. I visit companies, look at their software systems. And mostly, I find things like, things like this. <laughs> So this is legacy code in the end. What happened? Well, they started with a little thing which was wonderful, nicely done, perfect architecture. And they extended it and it was a really good software. So all the clients, all the users loved it and said, oh, please, please, could you just build in this feature and, on, and this on top and, and this again and please, please, quick, because it's so useful, it's so handy, it's so wonderful. And then the thing grew and grew and grew and nobody had time because all these features were coming and pressing the team. Nobody had time to clean it up, to think about the architecture, to do some refactoring. And actually, this is normal, isn't it? I mean, life and software development is like this. Uh, we can't do anything about it, you know? This is how it works, you know? And, well, when I get into those companies, um, I often ask in the first place, well, what is about your, I mean, how do you plan it? Do you have some time for refactoring? And then they, the developers look at, at, at me with big round eyes and they say, we would love to. Oh, well, there is none. Please, I don't know what you do, but try to get your management to give you like 20% of your time to refactor. Because this is what happens. And the first solution you create, the first version, is never the best one. You have to rethink it, redo it, work on it, change it. And um, this is something we learned and we try to, to get our, our development teams to do these refactorings. And well, who has it? Do you have 20% or something refactoring time? Yeah, okay. You should change job. Down there is this job board if you didn't, rent. Yeah, okay. Come to Hamburg. <laughs> yeah, okay, so what happens um, when people call me, the other day someone called me and said, Carola, can you please come by and help us? We have a problem with our software. Okay, what do you have? Well, we have three million Java lines of code and we can't, we, we don't know how to, we, we can't extend it anymore. It's, we are sort of stuck. Okay, three million lines of Java code or C-sharp or C++ or whatever. 
is quite a lot, but there is bigger software out there. There are 15 million, 40 million, there are huge systems. So three million is okay, you know, you can work with that. And then my next question always is, well, how many people are working on it? We have 30 developers with this three million lines of code. Okay, well, I guess some of them do bug fixing and some of them are supposed to enhance the system, build new features and so on. Yeah, but this is the problem. All the 30 developers are fixing bugs. Oh, this is not, not a good sign, you know? They really have a problem. If you have three million lines of code, there should be 10 developers doing maintenance and fixing bugs. If there are 30, something is really wrong. And then we go there and we have a look inside, and in this system of three million lines of code, we found this. These are 463 classes tangled together in a class cycle. So you can pull wherever you want, and everything comes with it. You know, you can walk from here all the way around. You can, can not cut it in pieces, although the colors indicate, we discussed the structure with the people, the colors indicate that these classes come from different components, different domain parts and bits and pieces. So actually maybe there should be some bounded contexts, but ooh, you know, this is really difficult. And these 463 classes, they are about 350 million lines, uh, 350,000 lines of code, so uh, it's almost 10% of the system, you know? And actually there are systems out there that have only 350,000 lines of code, and, and this is already enough work to do, you know? So this is really horrible, and in domain-driven design we call that a big ball of mud, you know? This is really a big ball of mud, and the question is, what can we do? And when I came here this morning, I met, uh, uh, the person who invented mob programming. Um, some of you uh, were uh, at his workshop yesterday. And actually, this is something we are doing, but we are not programming. We are mob architecting with the people, with the team. Here he is. Here. <laughs> so this is a stolen photo from the internet, just that everybody knows it and nobody comes up. So what do we do? We put the source code in a tool, there are some tools, I know maybe your tool is not there, don't be, um, don't be frustrated, I just don't know everything, you know, I just know some of them. And we, we look at the team, at the, at the software, at the source code with the team. Actually, this picture is from a tool like that as well. And we do mob architecting. So we sit all together uh, around the table, one person is doing everything um, in the tool and we discuss the architecture. And before domain-driven design was there, what could we do? What, what did we have? Well, we, had, we could discuss the patterns in the software, design patterns. We could tell them to do test-driven development. Actually, this is one of the questions I always ask the people on a telephone, you know? Well, how many, what's about your unit tests, you know? Oh, do you mean those? Automated tests? Yes, yes, this thing where it's green and, and red and stuff, you know. How many percentage do you, oh, oh well, maybe 10%? Well, then I already know what will happen because uh, if you do something in your daily work, please write unit tests. It helps the design because um, this thing here is pretty difficult to test. You know, you can't get one thing out and test it. You have to mock a lot and stuff. You know, it's really frustrating to test a thing like this. Who is, who is doing unit tests here? More than 80% in the business logic? Okay, 50%? No, okay. Yeah. So this is a good sign. It's getting more and more. I'm asking these questions all over the place. Maybe. Um, People um, do it more and more. So this is a good point. 
Of course, we can tell them, we could always tell them, write modular classes with one single responsibility. You probably all know uh, Robert Martin with his wonderful book on, uh, on, on uh, architecture with his solid principles and single responsibility is one of his first principles. And we could talk about high cohesion and low coupling and all this. On the class level, this was... We had a lot of principles, all these, but what, what, what could we tell them on the bigger level of architecture? Well, in the 90s, what could I tell them? I could say, please do layering. Huh? Do some technical layers. This was the best we had, and actually it was something, because before, people were programming SQL statements in their user interface, you know? It was already something good to tell people to have some technical layers, you know? But it didn't really help much to cut a big ball of mud into pieces. So domain-driven design, which, with its ideas about bound in context, really helped us a lot. Because all of a sudden, we had a possibility to cut a software system into domain parts, something like this. We want to have an architecture where, of course, we will have a technical layering. Yes, this is a good idea. Inside of our bounded contexts or domain modules or however you call them. And we have them separated from each other and we have loose coupling, coupling between them. Um, this is something I come across um, again and again, that people have a misunderstanding about what high coercion and loose coupling actually means. If you, if you program in Java and you have a package with classes in them, or if you program C Sharp or C++ or PHP or whatever, you have a namespace with classes in them, then we want this class, this thing that, that has all the classes inside to be highly coercion, which means that all those classes together, they should work tightly together to fulfill some job, some responsibility. And they should not need anything from other parts of the software to, to fulfill this job. This is high coercion. And loose coupling actually means as less coupling as possible, you know? Because more and more I get, to, get into companies where they say, well, we do microservices, you know? Um, and your coupling, yes, we have loose coupling. Well, how do you do it? Well, we um, de decouple it with events, you know? We do, we do a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of events, but they are not coupled, you know? And for me, this is a misunderstanding. This is technical loose coupling, you know? If you need to use some event uh, system, some messaging system for it or, or anything. But if you have a lot of events, your system is not loose coupled, loosely coupled. So, Really, this is, this is what it means. We have to find bounded contexts in our software that are self-consistent, that can do what they have to do on their own, with everything what is there. A bit like what Cyril told us before. And Cyril said that as well, and I'm going to show you what we see in, in legacy software, that actually we need bounded contexts and each of these bounded contexts have to have their own domain model. So this one, this one separated from each other. And when I look at a legacy system, things that are a bit um, larger than 500,000 lines of code, so the three million are already in there, I often see things like this very large domain classes where you don't really see anything anymore, you know? You, you have to, you don't understand what is all this about. Several models actually mis mixed with each other, squeezed together. If I look at a, a, la a large software system, I always um, search for the big classes. And you know which classes are big normally? 
the domain classes, the main domain classes, the customer, the product, the account, because everybody is programming, trying to reuse these main classes, and for a new functionality, they build some more um, methods, some more functions to the customer. That they're only for them, some new attributes. The other don't need them, but they need it. So the customer, the, the account, whatever, grows bigger and bigger. And if you want to have se separated teams working on their own, well, hmm, this doesn't really work. And in the end, everybody is frustrated. You, know? you have strong dependencies between teams. The other day, someone called me and said, uh, Carola, could you come? Yes, yes. Um, we want to divide our system into microservices. This is sort of the new version of this call I'm getting. You know, since two years, people call me because they want to divide their software into microservices. And I said, well, possible, I have to look at it. What do you have? Yeah, we have a million Java. Okay, could be an idea to, to cut it into a bounded context and have microservices. And what about your architecture, you know? And, well, I was sort of inside, I was thinking, now I get the 90% answer. The 90% answer to, to this question is, we have layers, like I have shown you before, because people learned that in the 90s. But this guy said, we have use cases. And I said, oh, okay, maybe we have a chance. And then I went there and had this mob architecting with his team and we discussed the architecture and what we do with these tools is, is we model the architecture on the structure that is in the source code. And I'm gonna show you and explain you what we found. So this is a picture from a tool called Sotograph, but with other tools you can create things like that too. And, and you, you see here these, um, these uh, rectangles that that with a name, and each of them indicates a use case. So there is a use case called mailing, import, export, remove, startup. Of course, I, I don't give you the real names because someone could recognize his system and I don't want that. And if we click on the, on the plus here, you would see all the packages and the classes we have put into mailing. You know? So the system is actually inside, and on the, on the right side you see these arcs, and the arcs are actually the relations between classes inside of mailing. So there are some classes in mailing that need something from import-export, and on the left side, it goes downwards, on, on the other side, upwards. So there, in remove, there are some classes that need something from import-export. Okay, so we start up here, and yeah, we have to cut this connection here as well. But this is already separated, so maybe here. Well, we go on, and then we end up with this. And this is called model. And the darker those rectangles get, the more is in there. So there's a lot in there. And I say to the architect, well, listen, what is this? Well, this is our business classes, the domain model, you know, for all of them. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, but if you want to cut your system into domain, well, into bounded contexts, we have to get rid of that. The model has to be inside of its bounded context. Can we maybe walk through it and, and move the model classes into their actual use case? Maybe, okay, okay, let's try. And then we started, and I think we stopped at calculation because then the thing already looked like this. You see, they got a bit darker up here. You, we really moved something up, but then we saw the whole mess, you know? The do, we, we took the domain model classes from down here and moved them into use cases where we thought they should fit in, you know? And then we saw all the relations that are spread around these use cases. So this is from a domain 
driven design point of view, if you want to cut a system into um, domain slices or into bounded contexts, this is as well a big ball of mud. And there we are. What can we do now? Because this is something I see very, very often. You know? The other day, a company called me and said, could you just come? We have a problem. And I said, well, what do you have? We have 270 microservices. <laughs> Woo. And you have a problem? Yes. If we want to change something, some new attribute, everybody has to come together. And I said, well, I mean, this was not the idea of microservices, I think, um, as far as I understood. You should have um, teams that are independent from each other. Yeah. And then I went there, and they showed me, and, and well, after a while, I found the same problem. I said, well, what is this? There was something that was called model jar. And the mo well, this is, this, is, this is the interface to the database, you know? So one database, one interface, all the microservices using the same model jar. Well, then it's clear that if you want to change something, everybody has to come, you know, because you have to discuss it with everyone. This is actually not the idea of bounded context and DDD, and this is the problem that we face with old legacy code. And if you listen to me already uh, uh, from this point of view, I, I look at Java legacy, C sharp legacy, C++ legacy. So we are far away from the times where only the COBOL and the PL1 was legacy code. Today, there's a lot of legacy code that was built in our, in, during our professional life. And yeah, we have to deal with that now. So there will always be work, you know, this is, this is for sure. <laughs> okay, so what can we do? What can we do if we find something like this? Uh, what can we do? Well, um, the thing that we uh, discovered in the last years, what we do to, to get out of this situation is that we actually step back from the legacy code and we ask our client to organize a workshop with the domain experts to find out where, from a, na from a natural, from a business perspective, there could be um, bounded contexts and the uh, the separation between them. And I was just listening to Cyril and it was funny because he said almost the same things, but I have some more and I will show you on an example. So he said exactly what is on this slide. He said, well, maybe in the organization there are departments or groups of domain experts and this is a good indicator for bounded contexts. Or maybe you, you, you find out that people use the same word, but they mean different things. You remember, you just had that. And what we do on top is we look at boundaries in the business process. So we try to find, to get the big picture of what this software system is doing and try to find um, points where information is just running in one direction, where there are different rhythms in the big picture or different triggers. And I will try to show you this with an example. Um, I know examples are always, I mean, you know, examples are always simplified. And of course, the real world is much more difficult. I know that, but um, I'm trying to give you an idea how it works. Um, I'm going to show you this with domain storytelling. Alberto will do event storming later on. Um, both are very well, um, very good tools for this. So what do you see here? This is the big picture of a little cinema. And what is happening here? The, uh, the whole thing starts with the ad agency that sends a booking plan about advertisements to the cinema manager. And the cinema manager takes this as, a, as an indicator to start to work on his weekly schedule. So this is a, an old cinema where every week there is a no, new weekly schedule. Maybe you remember cinemas like this. Next to my um, apartment there is still a cinema like that. So he starts to work on this weekly schedule and you see this little yellow arrow here. 
which indicates, oh, there's still some German in there, what a pity. Well, which indicates, <laughs> which indicates that this is done in the computer, with a computer system. He has a computer system already. There is a legacy, you know. And then, well, um, the film distributor company gives him a plan which film shows he could, um, could offer, and he looks at the, the countrywide numbers of visitors because he wants, of course, to order the, the good films, and then he calls them and discusses with, which films he could get, and then he finalizes his weekly schedule where if, when everything is done, when he's happy with it, and this weekly schedule gets transformed into auditorium plans because in this little cinema there are three auditoriums and of course we have to sell tickets from, for these auditoriums. And then the custard, the movie co goer comes and asks for tickets for one of these film shows next week and the ticket agent opens his auditorium plan, looks if he could find five seats or whatever this person wants, he, he offers them, the movie goer gives the money and the, the Ticket, uh, the seats are sold, uh, are marked in the system, and he prints the tickets, and then the moviegoer goes happily away with his tickets. So this is sort of the big picture, what is happening in this um, cinema. If you think about it, of course there are things missing, like the people distributing the ice cream in the breaks. Do we have ice cream? Well, whatever, um, and the people cleaning, and all this is missing. But this is what the system is supporting. And now um, we ask ourselves, how could we cut this? And the first thing you see, if you think about it, that there are two entrances, two, two triggers to get into this process. This happens when the ad agents calls, and here is the moviegoer that comes to buy a ticket. And this is done once a week, and this is done every time a customer asks for a ticket. So they are, from, from, their, from the time, they are different, differently organized. And if you think about it, you see that you could give them names. So you could call this one cinema management and this one ticket sales. And I have to think about better names because Cyril said something about ing words and Asian words, you know, like bounded context names that end off ing and, on ing and, a, and action. And I don't have this here. But well, we can go with it for the minute, okay? So cinema management and ticket sales. Okay, this is good. And then we think about it again and we see, oh, this is what I said too. The information flow goes only in this direction. There's no information going backwards. So this is actually done before and this afterwards. And if we think on top, we can imagine that in the ticket sales, there is a weekly schedule which is printed so that the customer can look at it and find out what he wants. And this weekly schedule has the same name as the weekly schedule the cinema manager has been working on, but it is a very different story because I hope that the cinema manager, or I know that the cinema manager in his software can not only plan in the film shows he want, but he can as well plan in when the, the, uh, the auditorium has to be cleaned, when the ice cream comes, how the advertisement is organized around the films. All this is, is, uh, is, uh, will, will be put into the weekly schedule by, by the cinema manager. But in the weekly schedule printed, Nobody is interested into, the, into know, knowing when the advertisement is shown. Well, maybe we would, you know, we would like to know um, when the actual film starts, you know, but they will never tell us you know, because they want us to come and see the advertisement. Okay, so two concepts, two main concepts, two, two words in our um, ubiquitous language that are each of them bounded in a context. They mean something different. And this is what Eric told us this morning, a ubiquitous language for each bounded context. And if we see this, we can cut our software following these ideas. Of course, for this one million lines of code Java system I showed you before, the process was much more complicated. There were more than two bounded contexts, but we used these indicators to find the places to cut. And then we actually go back 
to the system. So we identify the domain experts, we, we discuss with them the processes and the ubiquitous, ubiquitous language, we find bounded contexts. I put in here first ideas because I'm really a fan of agile, cyclic uh, reviews and think about it again if you... But anyway, we find bounded contexts, we think about domain modules we want and we try to reconstruct this in the source code. And we look at the architecture we find then and discuss it, analyze it and find a lot of violations, alternatives, refactorings and so on. And this is really a long way and a hard work. This is for sure because all these connections have been built into software for a long, long time. You know? If your management does not give you money for that, you can do things, although you will not cut your system into big bounded contexts. Because what domain-driven de domain design offers us on top of strategic design is that we know about tactical design. We know what to do inside of bounded contexts. So domain-driven design has given us building blocks, at least those down here, services, entities, aggregates, value objects, repositories, factories. Those I just put in from which you probably all know, model view controller as an idea, as design patterns that we have. And the good thing about design patterns and building blocks is that these, these names, these, I want to build a service class, I want to build an entity class or a value object, they do two things. The first thing is they describe what the responsibility of this class will be. So you probably would know where to put the responsibility of um, um, having some, some icons on the, some put-in fields and buttons, you would probably put this responsibility into the view, I hope, if you do model view controller. And the second good thing what these building blocks and design patterns do is they order our classes. They have rules which classes should work with, with um, which other classes and where this is not allowed. So I hope that you know, if you do, do domain-driven design, that a value object should never call an entity. This is forbidden. This is a rule. Or an entity should never call a service. This is as well forbidden and a rule. And if you do this, you will not end up with a cycle like that. This is impossible, that you end up with something like this because these building blocks and patterns already um, order your system. There's up and down. So, but if you have this, what can we do? Well, it depends, you know. If we are lucky and the people who have created this mess knew something about design pattern, we can use this knowledge. And actually, this mess was full of pattern. So I will show you now how we use this. If you don't have any pattern or building blocks at all in your software, this is the moment to start, you know? Start with value objects. Create value objects in your system. This is the first and best thing to do because with value objects, your domain model gets much more domain specific. If you don't have value objects, your, dom your entities will have strings and ints and characters and floats as parameters. They should all disappear. They should all be substituted by value objects. So just do that because the whole thing gets much better. But if there are already patterns in there, like in this case, we can do something very, very nice. Be what we can do is we can order this big thing according to patterns. And I will show you this now. This looks like this. So these are the 463 classes organized by patterns. We, took, we, we just used regular expressions to find all the classes that had controller in their name or had, an, had, an, um, uh, had a, a mother class controller or, or um, something else. So we, we could identify them and in this 
rectangle are all the controller classes. In here are all the view classes and so on. Down here, entities, value objects, and some other patterns they used in this system. We organized it, them in the way they wanted them. So entities and value objects down here, controller up there. And here you see the thing, Ugh, ugly, so much red, what a pity. But the nice thing is that with this view, we, we found a, a failure, a violation pattern. We found a pattern that they did in all those entities. They used some factory classes from up here to get some objects. And this is so nice. If you have patterns, normally you find violation patterns. And what we did then was we corrected this mistake. A lot of work, but after a month, the system looked like this. If you look at it, you see that client has disappeared. Client is gone. Client is not part of the, of the cycle anymore. And the red side it's, is much better. And I will show you now the, the rest of the cycle that was, uh, was still living in the system. And it looked like this. So the rest was only 184 tangled classes. This is much better than 460. I hope you can uh, follow me. And they are all like little islands. So this is a very good indicator. And the, the end of the story was that we saw that those teams actually had built their entities very strongly connected and we had to cut them. So we did actually what Cyril proposed, we duplicated classes. We did that. And in the end, we got rid of this thing. So um, normally when somebody asks me to come and look at their software, I tell them that I'm absolutely prepared for that and that, that I will help them to cut it into microservices. But I tell the people that the first thing I want to do is I want to look at the system and find out how modular it is and how much it will cost to get out of this situation where they are. And um, we have a lot of ideas about how to do that, but finally we ended up uh, with an index on the scale from 0 to 10, because we can explain this to the management as well. And I will show you now how it looks like. Yeah, I'm sorry, but we have to convince them to give the money. No? So this is our modularity maturity index. And what you see is, here is 0 to 10. So 10 is the best and 0 is the worst. And on each line here is exactly one system. So this axis doesn't really mean much, other maybe time or whatever. And, up, and you see the size of the system. So I told you about um, a system of 15 million lines of code. Here is one with 10 million. This is in Java. And this is in C Sharp. I have never seen a, a huge C-sharp system before because it was always like 300,000, 500,000 or something. And then a client sent me to a company in Romania who is creating a, a software to do the same as SAP, you know, the system for all the fin finance stuff. And I looked at the system and it was amazing. You know, they know what to do over there, you know, in, in Romania. If you find, want to find a good company and move to Romania, maybe... But there is everything. There is PHP, P, Java down here. So what we do is we look at the systems from different points of view. Are they modular? How much coupling is in there? How many cycles? Is there a good domain architecture? How is the layering? All this. And we condense it into numbers. And I tell you, management loves it. You know, they love it. Where are we? You know, where are we? Yeah. I'm just going to finish with a little story on this poor system. It was really, it was frustrating. Um, it was a customer who called us and said, well, we have a re real problem with the system uh, that one of our um, uh, service companies or is producing for us. This, this, this company doesn't even do anything um, about programming anymore. They just get other companies to do it. And we said, yeah, well, what's the problem? Well, 
the log files get so huge that the, that the, the, they, they, the, 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 the space on the disks is not enough. There are uh, timeouts at night. There, there are failures on the server. It's horrible. We, we can't, nobody wants to deal with the system anymore. Okay, we said, what is it? Three million Java, okay, so we, can't, we need an architect who explains, yeah, okay. So I went there with a colleague who is really deep into Java programming, and we looked at the architecture, and this architect explained to us, like this, organized, and the overall architecture was not bad. And we thought, well, what's the problem? And then my colleague looked into the Java source code, and I know him since 20 years, and I have never seen him as pale as that, you know? He was like, who did this? The, this person, I mean, all these people don't know anything about Java programming, this is impossible. And this was the first time that we saw a system that was, where the, the, big, the overall architecture was pretty, but the source code was horrible. Normally, it's the other way around. The people know their Java, you know, but they don't know architecture, so pff, this was really weird. So we asked them, well, what happened with this system? How, how? And they said, well, the original was done in Smalltalk. You remember Smalltalk, some of you? Yeah. Wonderful object-oriented programming language <laughs> without static typing. Well, and then we didn't find any programmers anymore, so we sent it to India, and they translated it into Java, and then, well, they kept it, and they enhanced it, and so on. I, I'm not at all against Indian programmers, but the ones they've chosen, they didn't know anything about Java. You could see that in the source code. And then they told us, um, well, uh, what, what should we do? We are down here, you know? And I said, yeah. I mean, you could take a lot of money and get it into a better range up here, you know? This is a possibility. You could, as well, try to replace it. Is there a replacement? And they said, yes, there is another, another system. We know a company, they, they have created a product for this, what we need there. And I said, well, if this is not your core, dom core domain, but, but a supporting domain or whatever, maybe this is a good idea. But maybe you let us have a look inside of this system as well before you install it, because maybe it's even worse than the one you have. You know, we never know. And then they send us there, and this system is up here. So this was, then we told them, well, if it's functionally what you want, this is a good idea to move over there. You will have much less prob problems. Um, and, well, actually, this is what I see a lot. Products that are shipped to several customers are in much better shape inside, much more, uh, the quality is much higher than for software systems that are just used inside a company. So I was not surprised that this software was up here. I could tell you a lot of stories about this, but anyway, I hope you take your break now and you're not like this. <laughs> and um, I'm, I have one uh, slide, one advertisement slide as well. Thank you for listening to me. You find me on Twitter. You can send me emails. There is a book on all this. Um, which is now only avail available in German, but at the end of February we'll have the English version ready, and then it will take another three months to create the book, uh, they said, and then there will be an English version. Um, I don't know about the title, maybe you can give me some hints, because in German it's called Long Living Software Architecture, and I'm not so sure if this will really work out on the American market. Yes, and domain-driven design, we, we translated Vogue Vernon into German, but this is not really helpful for you because you need English. Thank you very much.